Sorry about that. I will begin that again. A little too anxious. Thanks, Peggy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live. It is Saturday, September 14, 2013, and our special guest today is Wes Fryer. I'm Lori Moffitt, and I'm one of the co-moderators of the show, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. We are making a few changes in our co-host roles, and Lorna and Kim are now going to be, become backup co-moderators, but both of them are available to fill in whenever they are needed. We want to extend our huge thanks and kudos to both Lorna and Kim, who have been incredible co-moderators for the past four years. And today, our topics, mapping media to the common core with iPads. And Wes Fryer is our special guest. And all of the links as well as probably more than that, are in the Classroom 2.0 Live Binder. And the Live Binder has tabs on the left-hand side of the binder rather than across the top. And the link for the, the Live Binder here is not active. Uh, Peggy will put the link in chat. So all, as well as any links that you want to share that are relevant to today's show. Um, they'll be placed in the live binder later on. All of the Classroom 2.0 shows are recorded. The recording has been started, and they're posted at our uh, recording link here. That's the Archives and, Re and Resources page. And everybody has the. Um, whiteboard tools, we always like to find out where people are in the, wor in the world. So if you click on the, the pointer towards the, the, at the second icon in that toolbar, uh, you can show us in, on the world map where you're located. Usually we've got people from around the world, and we still do. Uh, I'm in central Pennsylvania. I know Peggy's in um, Phoenix, Arizona. Tammy's in southwest Arkansas. I'm not sure where Wes is, is logging in from, but he'll be taking the mic here shortly. So we're going to start with some polling questions. The first one, have you published some student work this year on an interactive website that allows parents to leave comments? And in order to participate in the poll, it's the last icon that's underneath your name. And once we have some responses, I'll publish the poll. And it looks like from those that voted, 26% have not, so that likely is helpful to Wes. Our second question, have your students recorded their voices in some projects this year that you've shared online? Let me clear those results. Go ahead and vote again for the second one. We have about 33% of the group that have not done this yet. And our next question, have any teachers at your school published books of student work electronically? And is printed books available for student checkout in your school library? Thank you. 
now over almost half of our group have not done this activity. So again, today's guest is, is Wes Fryer. He's going to be telling us about mapping media to the common core with iPads. Uh, Dr. Wesley Fryer is a digital learning consultant, author, digital storyteller, educator, and change agent. With respect to school change, he describes himself as a catalyst for creative engagement and collaborative learning. And he probably will, will embellish on his introduction. I wanted to give a brief introduction to Wes. I'll turn the mic over to you, Wes. Um, I will be capturing questions from the chat as you present, so we'll wait for the questions till the end, Wes. All right. Well, thanks so much, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you all here today. And I just love Classroom 2.0 Live. Um, you want me to go ahead, Lauren and, or, Lauren, and start with the newbie question? Or I was thinking my slides were coming up, and I, I and guess. That's fine. Yes, go ahead and answer the newbie question. OK. Well, you know, this shows that I'm oftentimes joining the, the shows a little late, not at this that early stage. So the newbie question is, why is it important for students to create with digital media? And I think there are a lot of good answers for this. But one of them is that when we use digital tools to allow students to represent things visually and with their voice and with movement, with, with animation or with video, we really open the door to a, a better window into what students know and what they can do. And so my short answer is because it's good for assessment. Now, it's also potentially very engaging and fun and involves you know, multiple intelligences and multiple ways of expressing things. There's lots of different reasons, but I would just I would say it's good for assessment. And uh, I'll talk today about why vocabulary is important and words are important. And just in the last couple of years, I've become more appreciative of how we can lose people or turn people off when we use jargon. And so when we talk about media and technology, it's important for people to understand that teachers have always sought effective tools and strategies to reach students. And you have a lot of teachers who will, who will still say things like, well, I'm not a techie person. Well, I'm really not into that. But if we're in, into learning and we're into kids and we're into helping students be able to learn and express and communicate and grow in the, the, in the most powerful and positive and constructive ways that we can, we're going to be into technology and digital media. So the resources for today, um, Peggy has wonderfully put a um, great live binder together because the links are not live on the um, webinar here, but they are in the live binder, so we'll refer you to that. And then you can also simply just Google mapping media, and I'm pretty excited that that, that should show up first on your, your list of hits. So I have a lot of slides here, and we may or may not get to all of them. But today is Saturday morning. I don't know what your favorite cartoon was. If you watch cartoons growing up, I remember when that was <clears throat> really a special thing. In fact, let's do that. Put that into the chat. What, is, what cartoon do you remember being one of your favorites from Saturday morning? Um, I bet the, the Super Friends one, but we've got the, the Smurfs, Felix the Cat. Um, you know, I don't know if Hong Kong Fui came on early in the morning, but that was one of mine <laughs> that we do right. So, you know, that used to be a real special thing. Well, a couple years ago, in 2010, I took this picture of my kids on a Saturday morning, and it wasn't special anymore that cartoons were, were on. Uh, what was more interesting to them were, you know, games that they were playing, Club Penguin. I, I kind of think this was a little before we were into Netflix, but it def things definitely changed a lot. Now, I just took the same picture about a month ago. And you'll see some of the laptops change, but what people have observed is the leg length really has changed here quite a bit. And this was on another Saturday morning. But the thing I want to point out to you is it's not a one-to-one -one situation. It's a two-to-one situation. And so 
while many of us have been encouraging schools to be looking at one-to-one -one implementations, I really think the world that we're living in now, as well as moving into, is a two-to-one or a three-to-one, where we have a smartphone or some kind of a tablet, and then we have a laptop or a desktop or something else. So um, I love this quotation from Arthur C. Clarke about magic, that sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and no matter how many you know, terms that you have for the different technologies we use, it really does seem magical. And I, I read this quotation, um, I think from her name is Marissa, I should have her exact name on this slide, but her, her quote was, your, your word is your wand. And we do have these wands in our pockets now, which are smartphones or iPod touches or, you know, other kinds of devices, if, we, if you have the what is it, this Galaxy Note, maybe that doesn't fit in your pocket, but, but um, you know, these tools allow us to not only reach out and access information, but be able to publish and share it in really powerful ways. Now, um, when I was doing some research, maybe you'd seen this statistic before, but when the iPad 2 came out in 2011, the processing power of that iPad, and that's still the, the main iPad that I have, that I use, was equivalent to the Cray supercomputer in 1985 which until the early 1990s was the most powerful computer in the world. Would you ever have imagined that you would have in your hand for your own personal use the computing power of a supercomputer? I don't, I don't think I ever really imagined that that would be true. And connectivity has really changed this too. A few weeks ago I had an opportunity to go to Chicago and work with some amazing teachers in Chicago public schools at their iPad Academy. And the day before we started, I was walking around Chicago with my iPhone, and I was able to Skype back to my wife's classroom with her third, fourth, and fifth graders. And we Skyped from the river, and they saw the river taxi, and probably most exciting, we Skyped from the Nike store and went up all three stories, and one of the employees there told about how he was a student athlete playing football at Bowling Green and what he was doing now with Nike and how you could custom design shoes and how they needed to, you know, work hard and stay in school. And it was unbelievable to be able to do that from my phone from anywhere that I was in Chicago. And, of course, that relies on a high-speed cellular connection. Um, and those are not available everywhere in the country. We know that if we've, we live or we, we, we travel and work in the rural parts of the country. But this is what the workflow looks like. And I'll give a shout out to Jenny Ashby. She's Jay Jash um, on Twitter. And uh, she's an Australian educator. And she is one of the people I've heard talk a lot about workflow and, you know, what are you going to use for your apps in order to do things. So in today's session, I'm going to talk about different products and things that we can have students create. And I'll talk a little bit about workflow and then mention some of those specific apps. So this is basically what that workflow looked like to be able to connect from a location that had high speed cellular service to another place where there was high speed internet connectivity. This was an article on GigaOM uh, a couple weeks ago that was talking about how the connectivity that we have today, just like processing power, I watched the keynote for the uh, Apple iPhone 5C and 5S this last week, and I was blown away that the processing power in the new iPhone 5S is twice as powerful as the iPhone 5, which I think is amazing. That's called exponential growth. It's doubling. Well, this article was saying that the, the high-speed networks in Asia are now just dwarfing in speed what we have in the United States because they're able to merge or combine different areas of bandwidth. So, you know, the, the high-speed connectivity is absolutely not a reality everywhere. There are digital divides in, in knowledge and in hardware and also in connectivity. But the change is all around us, and the, the, the speed and pace of it is, is really pretty stunning. But I would be completely irresponsible, I think, in my presentation today if I did not acknowledge and, and address the fact that we've got two sides to this. There's a good side and there's a dark side. How many of you, and you can just uh, raise your hand in, or I guess do a check mark in the, um, on like a poll, how many of you have had a family member post a selfie online, like on Instagram or on um, Facebook, or maybe you've done one too. You have some kind of a connection to selfies. <laughs> um, 
you know, we've had conversations in our family having now, you know, two, two teenagers and one uh, 10 year old. These, these are issues, you know, what are we going to share? What are we going to post? We've probably been at a meal either out at a restaurant or at, a, at, at home where devices have come out and people have been looking at their devices instead of looking at each other. And so one of the wonderful tools that I love to use as I work with teachers to talk about these kind of things is this book called Goodnight iPad by Ann Droid. And we're not going to be playing videos inside the session, but I'll encourage you again to check out the live binder. And the reason I think this is so powerful is this is a pretty reactionary um, you know, message. Basically, if, if you know Goodnight Moon, which is an awesome book, it's all you know, pattern after that. And the grandmother ends up throwing everybody's devices out the window because they're just too loud and too distracting. And I like how when you share this, it really resonates with folks who are saying, yeah, this technology is just negative and it's bad and it's causing all these problems. But we can also take a look at that message and then juxtapose that or contrast that with some really positive, powerful stories of how digital technology amplifies student learning constructively, how students are able to learn things they couldn't learn otherwise, reach a bigger audience, those kind of things. So I would encourage you to share that and then juxtapose or contrast it with some really engaging, wonderful, sort of you can't deny the benefit of examples of technology use. Because I think that's one of the ways that we really get our own attention and students' attention and, and focus learning is with cognitive dissonance. And so good, good Night iPad is a great way to do that. Um, when I was in Freeport, Maine a couple weeks ago, I used the website Padlet. And if you're not familiar with Padlet, definitely should. Um, on an iPad, it's great. It works on a laptop too, but on a, an iPad, you can just create the link and then folks can, can double tap and just put in their message. And so teachers were sharing messages that were coming in uh, or that they received. They thought, you know, what is Goodnight iPad telling us? What, what's the message of it? And today what I'd like to do is basically three things. Challenge the ideas that we have about iPads and learning, inspire you to create with your students, and last of all, persuade you to radically share your ideas because we live in an incredible day. It's the best day ever for learning, but it's also the best day for sharing. And while we have a lot of people online accessing content and being what might be called lurkers, we don't have nearly enough sharing, especially teachers sharing their work. And I'm also going to give away today 15 free copies of my new ebook, Mapping Media to the Common Core. I also created another discount code that I'll share at the end, which is for a 50% discount. So if you don't get one of the free copies, you can use the discount code, and that, uh, that's going to be good for all day today. So I'll be sharing that later. As I have been working with teachers using iPads with students, I have realized that a lot of teachers have this vision of the iPad and of student devices in general. That they are arcades, they are, you know, devices for independent individual work, and that this whole concept of using a tool like an iPad as a creation device isn't part of the mind where, part of the, part of the thinking of a lot of teachers right now. I want to encourage all of us to follow in the, the footsteps of Seymour Papert and think about iPads and other kinds of handheld and mobile learning devices as imagination machines, as bridges to creativity, as ways that students can express what they know and what they understand transformatively, going beyond what they could do just with paper, pencil, or whatever other traditional communication resources they have in the classroom, or even just verbally telling you live, being able to record things, do it multiple times, put their best foot forward. There's a lot of ways this can be transformative. And so I love the idea of students creating content that is shared out for a, a, a broader audience. I think I saw that Bob Sprankel is in the house. And, you know, Bob is a, an elementary teacher in in Wells, Maine, and was one of the first teachers I learned about in 2005 who was helping his students create a podcast. And they were broadcasting, teaching about their learning. The kids, you know, had some choice in, in what they were doing. And that kind of 
student created media is something that absolutely gets me fired up. And so uh, if we were together in person, what I would have us all say out loud, and maybe you can just say it to yourself quietly, is this. We remember what we do. We remember what we do. You know, this is straight from John Dewey. And we've got a lot of different voices about educational reform today, and a lot of folks are, you know, continuing to encourage us to focus on high stakes testing and accountability. And there's not enough, in my view, reminders about some of these basics that we know about learning, which is you can talk to me and tell me about it, but if you help me do it and create something with it and make something with it and then also share it back and teach it, I'm going to learn it a lot better. So this is a menu of a wonderful restaurant called Day's Takeout that's just outside Yarmouth, Maine. And this is not a typical Oklahoma menu. We, we don't typically have these things on restaurant menus. Uh, it's a different menu. And I like that metaphor of a menu because the menu of expressing what you know and showing what you know has expanded. And we need to help our fellow teachers, help ourselves, and help our students expand the menu. And so the first ebook I wrote in 2011, Playing with Media, um, which incidentally that 50% discount will work on, the, on that book as well. It's just on, on uh, either of the books. It has this framework of talking about how we need to communicate with text, images, audio, and video. And we need to be able to play with these tools because as we play with media, we are able to get more comfortable with it and, you know, the light bulb can come on for how we can use those tools with students. Um, this is the menu of playing with media. And what I'd like to do next is basically just give you a quick example of each product. There are 12 different products and then an app. A lot of those are free. A couple of them are, are paid. Uh, for the iPad that you can use with your students to create these different things. But before I jump into that, I want to remind us that relationships are so critical and so important. I just retweeted a post from Chris Lehman, who's the principal of the Science Leadership Academy in Philadelphia this morning, where he had a, a wonderful post about some interaction that he had with one of his students who was sharing some stuff on Twitter and led to a conversation and, and led to, you know, some encouragement about not being, not being depressed and down. It was about relationship. This is my son, Alex, who, you know, is a sophomore this year, but when he was in third grade with Mrs. Fitzgerald, his year wasn't great because she had a smart board in a room. And it wasn't great because, you know, they had some videos to show and look at as well as textbooks and trade books to read. It was relationship, and we need to remember that. Um, this is a quotation from Grant Wiggins just a couple weeks ago talking about creativity and high-stakes scores, and I'd encourage you to check this out as well. In many, many places, and I know we all come from different contexts, but we are feeling browbeaten by scores and, and encouraged to do test prep. And of course, we're going to have to have students take, take tests of different kinds, different assessments. But we need to regain the pride that, in many cases, we may have lost or felt that we're losing as a profession. And we need to be encouraged to, to be creative and to lead, not to follow um, some of the high stakes accountability and high stakes testing uh, pressure that's really damaged education. We've got to remember that words are powerful and passionate people are. It's one of the great things um, about the Classroom 2.0 Live community, right? I mean, everyone's here as a volunteer. Uh, you weren't forced to be here. And the fact that we're here together uh, learning some new ideas and some new strategies, and we're going to take these out. Man, that is, that is so powerful. And will the technology help us do that? Sure. But it's not the technology that's going to do that. It's, it's the passionate people. So um, raise your hand in the chat if you have, uh, or if you've heard this before, you know, if you buy an iPad or you buy this technology, your test scores will go up. In fact, if you want to put into the text chat what kind of a context have you heard somebody, a vendor, or somebody make a promise about technology like that? Um, I remember I saw a Texas Instruments uh, vendor presentation at TCEA a few years ago where literally the presenter said, if, if you, this is the silver bullet. If you buy this calculator, your test scores will rise, you know, and it's, it's simply not true. You can't just buy technology and have, have test scores go up. There is a great book that Larry Cuban wrote in 2003 called Oversold and Underused, where he looks at Silicon Valley and how the simple 
acquisition of technology and placement of that technology uh, in classrooms did not lead to, to rise in student achievement. But we do know that there are things that increase student achievement and uh, Robert Marzano's 2003 book Classroom Instruction That Works has great examples of research-based strategies that improve student achievement. And we can do these things with technology. Um, I had a chance in 2007 to go to uh, Hawaii and um, help set up a video conference for students back in Oklahoma for the USS Oklahoma Memorial Dedication. And one of the side benefits of being there was going to the Punahou School where Judy Beaver was the Instructional Technology Director. And it was Judy who shared that this book was what they used talking to their school board about why they needed to go one to one. It wasn't just to put technology in the hands of kids. It was because they could do these strategies better when every student had a digital device. They, students could non-linguistically represent ideas. Students could collaborate in transformative ways when they had digital tools. Um, we could increase time on task. We could increase parent involvement. We could provide more recognition. This is a great resource. And I'd also refer you to a book that's a couple years old, but it's still wonderful, called Web 2 That Works by Stephanie Sandifer. And that also has an alignment of these strategies to different tools and different strategies. So the goal today, and hopefully um, one of our goals just as teachers, is to redefine literacy and to recognize that we can't simply do what we've done in the past and be preparing kids for, for today or tomorrow. David Warlick's 2004 book, Redefining Literacy for the 21st Century, was, was a book that really helped shape my thinking about this. And I really hope to redraw that map for digital literacy. In fact, I don't know if Eric Langhorst is here in the, in the room, but that's, that's Eric with, and I with, with David a few years back. Um, common Core standards do include digital literacy. And Joe Wood had a great post uh, back in November of 2011 where he basically took digital writing and he tracked it through, you know, from kindergarten through 12th grade. What do students need to do? And I won't read all of this to you, but you can see that by 12th grade, students are not only being able to consume and, and act and uh, you know just watch or listen to media and evaluate it, they are also able to use it to present information, uh, to address problems and questions. So the Common Core doesn't say you know you have to use YouTube or you have to use Audioboo or Kidblog, but it does say your students need to create stuff. And this is a great question. Um, and I'll put this out in the chat. Why, why do teachers in your building uh, or your, your school district not allow students to create things? Um, what would the reasons be why, they, why they're not letting kids create things? Um, Phil says testing. Peggy says it takes too much time. Jenny says fear. Linda says they're unaware. Um, Nina says it's messy. Um, Trudy says it takes too long. You know, Jill says chaos. Right. All of these are reasons why, just technology aside, sometimes we don't let kids create stuff. Yet it's important if we want kids to learn that we're going to let them create because creativity has intrinsic value and it also has really strong uh, value in terms of long-term transfer. The 2001 revision of Bloom's Taxonomy does this really well in putting creation at the top. And so this is something else that I'd encourage you to point to and help, help other teachers see is, is the basis for why we're using technology is not just in what a vendor says and, and what they want to sell us, it's in the learning that can take place. When students are creating at the top of Bloom's, they not only can do the lower level knowledge and comprehension, they also have to do higher order thinking or they can be encouraged to do higher order thinking. It's not a silver bullet. We say, hey, we're doing a narrated slideshow and everything's perfect and beautiful in the class. No, that's not the case. But we can have deeper learning and we can have learning that reaches higher order thinking uh, more often when we're creating. So let's jump into it. I'm going to just sort of go down the list and start with interactive writing and go all the way down to digital stories and uh, just share a couple different examples. I'm very intentional about not calling this blogging. And I love blogging and I've been blogging for a number of years now. But interactive writing is not as scary a term or a phrase as blogging. Blogging just scares people. They say, oh my gosh, you know, I don't want to know what you had for breakfast. And isn't that something that a lot of people are just putting, you know, dumb stuff online about? I don't want to do that. Interactive writing. Here on the 
Classroom 2.0 live show, I think, in January. Matt Hardy, one of the co-founders of Kid Blog, was on, and I'd encourage you to check that out in the archive. It's one of the best um, professional development sessions I've seen about Kid Blog. He used the metaphor of glue. Whether you use Kid Blog or not, and they have a free app, uh, you know, to be able to access it on your Kid Blog on the, on the iPad. I think every classroom needs an interactive space where students can share their work and where others can comment on it. In our first question for today's poll, about 20% of you said this, that you've published student work interactively on a website. And I know that we've got folks in the chat who maybe not, don't have a classroom this year. They're working with teachers on, in another capacity as a librarian or a tech coach. But this needs to become normal, and it's not normal yet. So we need a place where we basically have different pieces of media that we're going to publish all throughout the year. Where do we get to show it and, and, and let parents comment about it? And that's our interactive writing space. The second product is narrated art. And this is my favorite tool, and not as tool, my favorite product to start with teachers. So if, if somebody says, hey, Wes, can you come? Or what would you recommend? We start with, we just got a card of iPads, or we're one-to-one. -one, what, what do we do? I will almost always say narrated art. And sometimes that sounds really elementary. It sounds really basic. And if you're a secondary person, you might be turned off by it. Um, there, on each of the Mapping Media pages on the web, you can see different tools. Not all of them require iPads, by the way, but I'll focus today on, on iPad apps that will do these things. Narrable is a free app um, that's relatively new, and it allows students to use their phone to call in as well as use an app on, if they have their iPad. But my son did one last year about the hyperbola for his Algebra 2 class. And so I challenge you to um, find a curriculum topic that you couldn't do narrated art about. You couldn't draw something and then talk about it for, you know, one to three minutes, something like that. Uh, this is something that we can do at, as kindergartners. We can do it as 12th graders. We can do it as university students. And it's also something that's not going to take weeks and weeks of preparation. And I like that idea of a quick victory. That's a term I learned from Marco Torres a number of years ago, and um, I, I just love that. Um, next is radio show. Again, notice I'm not calling this a podcast. I love podcasts. I listen to podcasts every week. In fact, uh, John Samuelson, iPad Sammy is here, and you know I've, I've, I've just loved listening to their Techlandia show the last semester. But podcast scares people. How about a radio show? That doesn't sound quite as scary. I've got a link here to um, Amy Payton's little radio show she did last semester for a class I was teaching um, at a distance for teachers in Montana. And I just love this. She was interviewing their kids, and they were talking about um, you know, some of their reading that they were doing and interviewing those kids. I love it when kids do things like, this is WXYG you know, radio coming to you from Twin Bridges, Montana. And when you, when you don't have a camera involved, I've noticed that sometimes kids and adults can be more creative. You don't have to worry about what you're looking like and what people are seeing, so you can be expressive with your voice and you can really have fun with it. And that is, that's just awesome. And well, and I didn't mention that Spreaker was that app on the side that's a free, they give, they give you 10 free hours um, to, to post stuff on their site. Next, five photo stories. I'm going to talk about digital storytelling, but a digital storytelling project can take a lot of time and can be pretty intimidating. And so this five photo story idea I, I love because it's something we can readily do. You can see there in the corner the apps you'd use on the iPad are just your camera app and your mail app. Um, this is a five photo story about, yes, Red Riding Hood that was created during one of our iPad media camps this summer in July. And teachers, if you've got students involved, you know, will use resources that they have and be able to represent something in five pictures. You know, that can be the, the actions of a chapter in the book you're reading. It could be the water cycle. In this case, it's a fairy tale, but that's the five photo story activity. Um, next is visual note taking. And um, I have to give a shout out uh, because I am not a very capable well, I haven't considered myself to be a cap very capable drawer, visual, visual artist. And so um, I've got links there in the, uh, on the page to a variety of different folks who are amazing visual artists. Brushes is a free app for your iPad. And basically, 
we are not very open typically in, in secondary and higher education to drawing. We think, no, your notes need to look like Roman numeral outlines and it needs to be text. However, why should we do that? Because when you have to draw a picture of something to represent it, that can actually be a more active process than passively copying text off of an overhead or off of a PowerPoint. And the litmus test of uh, good notes is whether or not you can tell me back the key points of those. And so Rachel Smith has a fantastic TED Talk called Drawing in Class that I have linked on the page. Um, those are some visual notes I took this summer at the Podstock conference, but that's what visual notes are. Um, next product is called Narrated Slideshow or Screencast. And this is one that every single teacher needs to be able to create, regardless of your grade level or your content area. A lot of folks have heard of Khan Academy now, but not, I would say, I would, I would, I think I'm, I'm, I can't say this with a research basis, but my experience says far fewer than half of teachers today in the, in the K-12 and university classroom have created one of these. So Explain Everything is my absolute favorite app for the iPad for, for doing this. It's one of my top three apps for creating content. Um, I do like EduCreations, which is free, but you can do things with Explain Everything you can't do. I was just showing some of my wife's fourth and fifth graders this, this last week um, how to do some quick narrated slideshows about some projects they've been researching. And this is an example of a science project that my middle daughter did a couple years ago. So we really, really need to help teachers understand the power of replicating yourself, and not just as a teacher, but as students, being able to teach, being able to record multiple times till you get it right. This is a, a huge, important thing to do. And when we can draw on the screen, of course, then we can do things like show math problems and show the, the emphasis, and that's where it kind of becomes um, a screen, a uh, screencast and not just a narrated slideshow. Puppet video. Um, put in the chat, if you would, any apps that you've used to create Puppet videos before. You don't have to use an app. I, I love Puppet Pals. I actually haven't used the new version that much. But uh, again, like I mentioned with Radio Show, when your face isn't on the screen, sometimes you get super excited about expression because that's really a lot of what you have in terms of communicating that you express with your voice. So Puppet Pals and, and Sock Puppets and some of these other tools are really fantastic to help students be, be able to be creative, express ideas, but do it in creative ways. And you can you know, resize these objects. They can have dialogue back and forth. Um, there's a whole lot that you can do with an app like Puppet Pals. I do recommend the director's cut because it gives you the ability to take your own pictures and cut out like you see in this, this screenshot. Um, of this video that the teachers have, or the students have actually put themselves into it. You can't do that with the free app. You've got to have the paid app. And then it gives you all the other uh, libraries of, of apps. Um, next one is going to be quick edit video. Um, raise your hand in the, in the chat if you have created a video with the iPad using iMovie where you've edited together a couple voices. Um, that ability to put together a video quickly, it's something the iPad really, really excels at. And so I'm going to encourage you all to do that this year by, you know, getting permission, of course, and, and recording some video, but then stitching together a couple things. Uh, being able to be mobile. This was a science project my son did a year or so ago. And we just used the camera app that's built in. And then YouTube has a great free app called Capture which, yes, you can use to capture, but I typically use it to upload. And it will upload um, longer videos. You can trim videos now on YouTube after you upload. Um, but you can also, and sometimes that's the faster way to do it. But you can also do that in an app like iMovie. Product 9 is an ebook, And we had um, about 10% of you say that at your school, some teachers have published books, both as ebooks and print books. This is a fantastic book that I learned about that Jane Ross, who is a teacher in Jakarta, Indonesia, created, pardon me, about a year ago. Uh, I guess it was in January, so it wasn't quite a year ago. No, that was like eight months ago <laughs> um, when she published it. And, and it is published in multiple languages. So it is in Batak and it is in English. She used Book Creator, which this summer became a free app to be able to create one book. So you can make one book for free with Book Creator, and then I think it's $3 after that. That is 
the top three apps that I love on the iPad for creating are Explain Everything, iMovie, and Book Creator. Last week, Apple announced iMovie along with the other uh, iPhoto and Pages and Numbers. Those are all free now on new iOS devices. Um, it's exciting that Book Creator is free to create one, and I think that needs to be in, in everybody's library. And I'll tell a story here in a little bit about creating a print book too. GeoMap is one of the products that is harder to do on the iPad at this point. We're going to see more apps probably emerge that will help us do it on the iPad. Google has updated what they call their Map Engine Lite, which does allow you to do a little more creation of a geo map. This is an example geo map of our tornadoes that we've had in South Oklahoma City, dating back to the May 3rd tornado in 1999 to our May 20th tornado this year and the path that those tornadoes took. You can see this isn't a super fancy, you know, map. But we're able to overlay not only lines and shapes, but we could also put media on this. So I could see text, and I could see images, and I could even have video. And so that is a geo map, and it's a very powerful way for students to be able to show something that has a geographic connection and to be able to explain it. Product 11 is a simulation or game. And if you have not yet seen this amazing fourth grade project using Minecraft, a student in San Diego created this and he built an entire replica of one of the missions in San Diego and he did it in Minecraft. Now, I am 99% sure he didn't make this on the iPad. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty positive he made it on a, a laptop or desktop using the full version of Minecraft. But this idea of being able to create a simulation and then explore a simulation is really uh, compelling. I, I don't have augmented reality in here, but augmented reality is this ability to, to bring virtual objects or videos or other things, you know, and have them triggered when we, when we kind of like a QR code, take a, a picture or have a trigger that, that pops them up. I'm excited for somebody to come up with the Minecraft trigger. Um, there is a app that I have not played with yet, but I have been having this on my list of things to, to do. It's called Augment, A-U-G-M-E-N-T. And you can take now an object out of the Google 3D warehouse and then make it a virtual object that students can explore. So this whole genre, it definitely takes a lot more time, but there, it's amazing to see what can be done and also just the engagement that kids have as they're creating an entire simulation or a game or something like that uh, about content that may be related to the curriculum. Last product is digital story. And digital storytelling, it, I just, I love for so many reasons. We've been telling stories to each other forever since the cave. And now we have the ability to digitally document those. And so iMovie is a great app, but if you really are interested in digital storytelling on the iPad, you need to check out Pinnacle Studio. It is the most expensive app that I've ever purchased. Uh, Gregory Mitchie, who is incidentally a phenomenal author, I just listened to his, his book, Holler, If You Hear Me, it's about urban education in Chicago. He used Pinnacle Studio this last year to help his students on the iPad create a little more sophisticated video that can include B-roll, both still images and um, video. You know, if you're going to look at a documentary on television, you're rarely going to see that talking head video shot. They might start with an, what's called an A shot, and then they're going to switch to B-roll so you see a context of what we're discussing and talking about. So uh, check Pinnacle Studio out. Um, I also got some how-tos. There's another website that I have called iPad with Wes, and that's one place I've posted those. They're available on YouTube and I think on the Mapping Media site too. So uh, we're in a battle for hearts and minds when it comes to a lot of things, including uh, technology in, in the classroom and, and technology in our school, but just also in moving forward with how learning needs to be happening today in, in school and outside of school. Um, I want to tell you a quick story about an ebook, and then I might, I think I'm going to end up skipping some slides because I, I, uh, I want to leave some, some Q&A time. Um, but here's the quick story. Rachel, are you still here, honey? Okay, she went upstairs. Um, my daughter is here. I have realized that we need bridges. You know, books need to, be, books can be bridges between, you know, the old ways of learning and the new ways of learning. And so uh, a couple, well, maybe a year and a half ago, Rachel had wanted to make a book 
uh, she had, you know, helped me and seen me make my ebook. She said, Dad, I want to make an ebook. And so we, we made this book together, Meet Snowflake. But it took about three hours on a Saturday, and I had done a lot of the work because I had set up the mic and done the recording and all this. Well, fast forward to um, this year, and, and Rachel's in third grade, and I want to empower her and other students in her class to be able to do the same kind of thing, to, to publish ebooks. And so I introduced Mrs. Moore, her teacher, before spring break to Book Creator and loaned her an iPad mini and just said, here, you can just use this the rest of the year. And she took it home and played with it. And Mrs. Moore and the students created a book called Our Favorite Books. Now, we published that in several versions. One of them is a print version using the print-on-demand site lulu.com. We actually used the PDF file, which Book Creator can make, and then using the preview application in, on the Mac, not any fancy paid Adobe you know, version of, of Acrobat, we, we made it into an A5 size book. And that's a standard print size that Lulu prints. And so it cost $13 to get those printed in color. And we got those printed for each student. Ms. Moore wrote a custom note to each one. And on the last day of school, after the awards ceremony, Mrs. Moore presented this uh, to parents and to kids. And we listened to the kids reading. They, they each picked their favorite book, drew, a, drew some artwork, and then wrote a paragraph. And then they read it. And they recorded it. And so that book was available in multiple formats. And it was really a great celebration of their ideas, of their voices, and the way that a book now, when it becomes electronic, can be more than a book that simply has printed text and printed images. So um, we had more time. That is a, that's a good project to talk about, and it's a replicable project. You can do this this year. Yes, Lisa says she's stealing this idea. Do it, Lisa, absolutely. And then please tweet me so I can retweet your project and share it, because the light bulb comes on for parents and teachers when we do this in a way that it doesn't with a podcast or a blog or something else. Because no, we don't have any schools in America or I think worldwide where parents are coming in angry saying, why are you focusing on books? Why are you helping my child write a book? No one is arguing about that. They, parents understand why books are exciting and, and why they're valuable. And, and, you know, the idea of students having their voice and recording is just a great thing to add. So I'll make this comment, and then I'm going to uh, skip a little bit to, to the end and some questions. Uh, we've got different folks, in, in, people in different places with respect to digital learning and digital technology. And Mark uh, Prinsky in 2001 wrote his article about digital uh, natives, digital immigrants. I like to think of more groups than just that. Uh, there's folks who are, who are refugees who are fleeing from the digital landscape. Uh, we've got folks who are not decided, and we have bridges. And so we have an opportunity, I think, to be digital bridges as we create media and we help our students create media. We've got folks all over the spectrum, all over the curve in terms of adoption. And if we want to help folks adopt technology and really move forward in the ways that, that they are learning and helping students learn, I think we've got to focus on empowering. And so that was my big epiphany with the book project. Um, our favorite books was, it's amazing how the iPad and book creator specifically empowers students and teachers to be able to directly create and publish and to need minimal intervention from the outside expert. So this is what that, um, some apps that you can use. Uh, book Creator for iPad is wonderful. If especially you're a secondary teacher, I'd encourage you to look at Creative Book Builder. It allows you to bring in YouTube videos, content from your Dropbox, from Google Drive. Um, you can just be more sophisticated on a completely iPad-based uh, ebook. And then that QR code, or you can just use that shortened address, wfriar.com slash ebooks, will give you a, a wealth of other resources relating to, to ebook creation. So uh, we've got about 10 minutes left, and I'm gonna, I want to go ahead and basically wrap this up and go to some questions. Um, I've got, and you can look at these slides a little bit later, but I've got some more things about narrated art and uh, quick edit video. But I am going to try, and I think I can, to skip down here using my handy dandy slide sorter. And I'll go here to some closing thoughts. Um, I want you to check out, if you haven't already, Dean Shiresky's pre-conference keynote he did for K-12 Online in 2010. It's called Sharing the Moral Imperative. 
And this is something that really pushes the boundary because we don't think about sharing as a moral obligation, but Dean makes a great case for this. I also want to challenge you to print out, yes, I said the word print, this PDF that you'll find on the K-12 online site, give it to at least one other teacher at your school and say, let's do this together. Let's look at some of the presentations coming up in October and let's learn together because there's some phenomenal information and ideas and just connections that K-12 encourages and it's about sharing. Uh, this is my dad's scrapbook that he made when he was an elementary student. He pulled out of the garage a few years ago. And, and as you might guess, this is a priceless thing for us to be able to have, you know, photographs of my dad when he was in elementary school. But here's his report card, which some six weeks had comments and some six weeks didn't. And we have numbers over here on the side. Uh, we've got original signatures of my, my grandparents who were passed away. And I think that's, it's pretty amazing to have that. My closing question is, what should that report card for your students look like this year? What should it look like in 12th grade? Part of the answer is it needs to have more media in it. There needs to be more digital artifacts. Uh, we're headed exciting places where the coastline, you know, hasn't been fully mapped. That's why we need to be mapping media to our curriculum. Um, and uh, here we go with the codes, the discount codes, and I'll drop these into the chat. Uh, if you'd like, you're going to need to go to the mapping media page and you can use the discount code LiveClass20. That is um, the same as the Twitter hashtag. There's 15 free copies um, that you can use. You're going to click Add to Cart. You're not going to click on uh, getting it from, from Amazon. Uh, but when you click Add to Cart, you'll be able to do that. And then here's a 50% off discount code, which is just Live Class 2013. And that is good all day long. Um, so you can download that. Um, Welcome to Harry Potter Day. We've got wands now in our pockets. Our kids do too. You know, are you in Slytherin or are you in Gryffindor? You know, what kind of a choice are you making with your device? Uh, we've got to help students. We've got to encourage each other to be making good choices with these powerful wands. We've got to remind each other that it's about making stuff. If we're about learning, we've got to be about making. Because if we're not making stuff, it's questionable whether we're, we're learning stuff for the long term. My challenge to you is, in the next parent conference that you're in, have more media than you did last time to help that parent see what their child knows, what they understand, and what they can do. And we've got seven minutes for questions. So I'll turn it back over to Lori. And uh, if you've got some questions from the chat, Lori, or if we want to give folks the mic. Thanks, Wes. I'll start with questions from chat. Let's see. Um... Um, Walwisher used to be slow. Now that it's Padlet, is it any less sluggish? So is I've had good success with Padlet. Um, yeah, you know, and I've I've used it with a bunch with lots of people at the same time. So it I like how you can customize the mm -hmm. URL, and I've had good success with Padlet. So yes, I'd say give give it another try if if you haven't since the Walwisher days. Good. Um, what was the student to iPad ratio for some of these projects? Was it one to one or were they working on the same iPad? So in the case of the ebook project, that was just one iPad in the classroom and then kids, you know, did their did their work, created their art, decided what they were going to write, and then when it was their turn got the iPad. Mm -hmm. um, most of the projects I've been working on have been cart based. So there's a cart of iPads that we wheeled into the, the classroom uh, for students to create. So um, it's going to vary. For all of the products in Mapping Media, you don't have to have an iPad. There are different tools and apps you can use on desktops and laptops. Um, and, and so my encouragement is to you know, select a product that you'd like to make and then identify what kinds of tools will work with the resources that you have. Mm -hmm. Are phones in the classroom better than a tablet? Smartphones, I guess. Oh, oh, smartphones? I would guess uh, it's smartphones. Well, no, I think, I mean, for instance, Book Creator runs on just the iPad. And then there are, there are apps that run just on the iPad and not on a smartphone. Um, you know, my, my advice is whatever you have, use it well. I see good advantages, for instance, to Chromebooks and students being able to log in with their individual accounts. Um, but at the same mm -hmm. time, you can't do a quick edit video on a Chromebook uh, the same way that you can do it on, on an iPad. So I tend to like creating more on an iPad 
than on my phone. The, some people have talked about, you know, editing a movie on your phone, sort of like painting on a grain of rice. Uh, you know, <laughs> but some kids or, or even adults might might not find that to be that that big of a deal. So whatever you have, use it well. Focus on on the tool on the products that you can create with students. If you have a choice, you know, I would favor a, favor a tablet like an iPad over just a smartphone because I think there's more apps that you have, and then you've got more screen real estate to be able to work with. Who sets policies for using iPads? Well, hopefully your school district has already an acceptable use policy for technology. I'm sure they do if you're in the United States and you get E-rate funds. But there may not be a, a policy as far as pu the publication of student work and that permission. So my recommendation is that teachers, um, you know, work with their administration, but also, um, you know, send notes home to parents when you're going to be uh, creating something new as far as students are maybe this is the first time they're going to be uh, posting with media. I'm going to drop into the chat right now a link on a, on a, it's a playing with media share site and it has examples of uh, media posting policies from um, mm -hmm. Kansas City Public Schools, Cobb County, Georgia, and Yukon Public Schools. And so it's definitely, from a policy standpoint, something that's done collaboratively with administration and the school board. But there are many schools that haven't been having that conversation and are, are, or are in the midst of it. We've got a lot of schools that still don't let kids bring devices or get on you know, Wi-Fi and things like that. So we can each be catalysts in our own ways for these kind of conversations. And we can point to other schools that are successfully doing that and the ways in which they are you know, adopting policies that allow for students to bring devices and then you know have have ways of managing the permissions and, and those kind of things because the last thing any of us want is for something to blow up and be very negative with respect to social media or digital technology and so it's it's important that we work with our administration and be you know in the conversation about how we can do this and how we can empower students to do this um, and and a word I guess I didn't mention with interactive writing was moderate. I advocate moderated interactive writing and tools like KidBlog allow you to do that. So you are able to approve you know, comments and posts when they go up. Of course, we can't control what students do on Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and these other things when they're mm -hmm. outside of school. And so that's why the key is we need to be having conversations and creating media together and sharing so that we can talk about it. So. So adults are involved in conversations about this stuff with kids, and they're not just on their own deciding what they're going to do. And you know. okay, we've got a couple more here. Any good iPad apps for introduction to programming since Scratch isn't available? You bet. Um, on the Mapping Media site, if you and I'll drop this into the chat. Um, if you go to the Simulation or Game page, um, I've got some um, some different ones. Um, uh, let's see, um, Codia and Hopscotch are the two that, that come to mind. Um, Hopscotch is free, it's very scratch-like, and that's what I would start mm -hmm. with there. Somebody asked what happened to Scratch. It's still around. It's, for now, entirely web-based. Right, yeah. Right. 2.0's browser base. Right. Based. I haven't worked and tried to do much with the iPad on Scratch. We've still just used the laptops. But you no longer have to download software to work on your Scratch projects. They're all saved on the web automatically. Mm -hmm. The last question I saw in chat was, how do you connect your iPad to your projector or whiteboard? This teacher is the only one who has an iPad in her school. Oh. So it, it, using it in school is OK. New. Um, there's a great. Uh, link that Tony Vincent did, uh, which maybe somebody can Google for him, was trying to find it on his Learning in Hand site. And it gives a breakdown of the different options for using projectors. Basically, I, I recommend getting the, I guess dongle is not the right word to use, using the video adapter, uh, which is usually like 30 bucks. You can connect your, um, your iPad to the screen and plug it in just like you would a laptop. There are also some options for um, being able to mirror your iPad. You can get an Apple TV, but there's software. Um, I use primarily Air Server. My wife has a Windows XP Windows machine, so she uses Reflection app. And if we can, yeah, there it is. Awesome, Susan. Thank you. Susan, then uh, the elder popped in that link 
five ways to show your iPad on a projector. So that was from Tony Vincent, and it, it breaks down several different ways to do that. Thanks a lot, Wes. You are welcome. Thank you so much for the chance to be here. And I'd love to hear from folks as they create with students. And I'm hopefully soon, not hopefully, I will be soon getting some badging up on, on Mapping Media too to be able to encourage folks to share individual project, projects and products as well as student projects. That's great. So I'll, I'll close out the show. And then if there are more questions, we can come back. I know it's a little past the top of the hour. Uh, we want to point out Steve Hargadon's next uh, interviews for Future of Education, September 25th, with Christine Gross-Lowe on Parenting Without Borders, Tuesday, October 1st, with Will Richardson on Why School, and Tuesday, October 8th, with Yovel Badash on No Child Held Back. And our upcoming Classroom 2.0 live shows are Saturdays starting September 28th. We have no show on September 21st because of the, the global STEM, STEMX conference next weekend. The 28th is with Zoe Midler, who's our featured teacher. October 5th is the, a preview of the K-12 online conference with their organizers. Also no show on October 12th or the 19th. The 12th because of the Reform Symposium and the 19th because of the uh, Library 2.013 Worldwide Virtual Conference. Here's some information about the Global STEMX Education Conference as well as five other upcoming virtual open and free conferences. Uh, Global STEMX is September 19th to 21st. The Connected Educator Month is October. The Reform Symposium is October 11th to 13th. The Library 2.013, the Future of Libraries, October 18th to 19th. And Global EdCon is November 18th to the 22nd. When you exit the show, you should get uh, the, the survey, and I'll talk about the survey, but you can also nominate a featured teacher, jumping ahead of myself, uh, by filling out the form at uh, tinyurl.com, CR20Live, featured teacher, nominate, without the E at the end. Um, and you can nominate yourself, too, if, if you'd like to, to, to do that to the featured teacher of the month. So that helps celebrate classroom teachers and we can learn from each other. Here's the link for the survey. Um, it should automatically open in your web browser when you leave or you can click the link in the chat box as you watch a recording or hear in the live show or the survey is available always in the live binder as well. When you do fill out the survey. You can request the certificate of participation for uh, professional de development, and um, that will then be, be emailed to you. You want to make sure the email is is current email, and um, you don't want to use a school email. Sometimes schools will will block this kind of of email. Other resources are the video collection and the audio collection. And that those are both on iTunes U. So you can see this recording in either video or listen to it in audio. There's also an RSS feed that's created for each show that's available on the show archives page. And so there are many, many different resources that are built based on the live show. That's where the, the blog post is, and uh, you can get to the recording later today on that page. And we'd like to offer special thanks to Wes Fryer as our special guest today, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and Web 2.0 Labs Project and Weebly for providing our website, 
Blackboard Collaborate for providing the classroom and everyone who participated in the show today. Thank you. And forth about that. So I'll mention that uh, the the ebook project definitely got more teachers excited at her school about you know possibly creating with media and doing some similar kinds of things the principal as well so all right well let me see if I can get her hang on while we wait for her to come anybody else want to want to post a question or take the mic here she is all right so I'm gonna so tell everybody who you are and what grade you're in. Um, I'm Rachel. I'm in fourth grade. And why do you think it's important for teachers to help their students create ebooks and create with media? I think it's important because kids get a chance to express and make digital ebooks, and I think it's good for everyone and it's fun to do. Okay. We've got a question here. Um, ooh, Jose's in California, and he says, you're famous, by the way. Um, Lori says, can you talk about, oh, that's, well, tell a little bit, of, I'll tell about the book creator to PDF. Can you talk about what you did in class, like how that worked for the, in Ms. Moore's class with the ebook? In Ms. Moore's class, um, our teacher, we um, got an iPad mini, well, and we got book creator, and we started, it was a book report so you chose a children's book that you liked and you would make a small summarization of the book and draw a picture and so we took a picture of the book and then we added in text. Well you took a picture of your art right? The yeah. Art that you, drew. you took a picture of the art that you drew and then we added text to it and we added all of our pictures and art together and we made an ebook. Alright. And I think everyone liked it. Some of the people in the chat are commenting that they remember you doing your first haircut. So, do you remember all the way back then to using VoiceThread? Um, a little bit. How does it feel knowing that, like, lots and lots of people have heard you over the web talk about things? Does it feel weird? Well, not really, but a little bit. It can feel weird because sometimes I really don't know what to say, but I got used to it, like, over the fact, talking and being recorded. and. I think I've gotten a lot better at it since the first time I did it. Absolutely, you have. Okay. Um, we'll see if it, uh, anybody else has a question for Rachel. I'm going to, can you all hear my voice okay right now? You know, can put that in the chat. I'm, we're using a headset. Yeah, hey, good. So I'll just leave that. So um, I don't remember if it was Paula. Somebody asked about the workflow, or I think it was Lori uh, Yingling. So the workflow to get to, uh, Lulu, I do have a post about this, and I'm I'm gonna I'll, I, I'm gonna write this up in some greater detail. Basically, Book Creator lets you export your final book as either an iBook or <laughs> it um, lets you choose PDF. And so to get it on Lulu, I chose PDF, and then I saved it to Dropbox. So that allowed for you know a link that I could get on the on the laptop. There you go. What? You might you might want to see something else. Oh, yeah. Hang on. <laughs> Um, so I downloaded it on on the Mac laptop, and then with Preview I opened it, and and just like I would print a PDF, um, I went to the print dialog, but instead of just you know taking a PDF and printing another PDF, you can change the layout, and one of the layout options was A5, and that's one of the standard sizes that Lulu accepts. So that was that was basically it, and um, I can. Tweet you, Lori, a link to. I have a post where I talked a little bit about that, and then that might. I'm thinking about maybe writing that up as a separate sort of project, you know, PDF or something like that. So, um, okay. Question is from Peggy How did you get your kids started with technology at what age? Rachel, what do you remember doing early with technology, and what have you done with technology? The first thing I can remember that my dad was having me do with technology was we would go places and we'd experience and then we'd get out audio boot on our iPhones and then we'd record a little bit and then we'd post them to our family blog and share them with people. Yeah. 
So that and that has been a big thing. I guess having a space to share, it's the, the interactive writing idea. So we had the family blog and then we had a place where we could share and post things, I think has been important. And then as we've learned to use different kinds of media, uh, we've done some videos, we've done puppet pals, um, now we've done some screencasts and things like that. What have you taught people how to do on your screencast, Rachel? Well, one of the things I like to do in my free time when I'm not at school or anything, I like to play Club Penguin, which is a virtual world that you can play on the computer and get accounts and stuff. Um, I, I'm pretty much an expert at it. I've been playing it for a long time. And I like to make videos to teach people how to do stuff on it. So Lisa has a question of what's similar to Audioboo. If you go to the narrated art page of Mapping Media, there's a bunch of different uh, tools that are, that are linked and listed there. Um, some of them, like Audioboo, let you put a picture together with your audio. Narrable was one of those. Um, there's some other ones that are, that are newer. I haven't gotten to play with Recordium a lot, but it's neat because it allows you to do some bookmarking. Um, but there's a bunch of, of apps there. Um, you are welcome, Melissa. Uh, Lynn, uh, Lori says, how would you transform the traditional state report or country report? Well, let's ask Rachel. So you're, if you had to do a report this year on just a country or a state or something, mm -hmm. how, would you, how could you use media to make that report um, better and maybe more fun to do? Can you well, think of what I would probably do, which I would choose my country, and I might, I would probably do a narrated slideshow and get images from Google, and then um, add tech, well, and then just narrate my pictures and put them all together. That's probably what I would do. Okay. And that's, you know, that's the idea of building a repertoire of different products that we could turn to and, and use. So Rachel's seen narrated slideshows and heard about those. So Lisa's asking if you've used augmented reality. Have you used augmented reality? Do you remember the Kolar app that mom did at, at church with the dragon and stuff? Were you there for that? Oh, yeah, I saw that. Describe that and tell people what that was like. Um, well, this app that my dad's talking about, it's so you down, well, you print off these pictures of like something and then um, it's just a regular sheet of paper, and you color it how you want to. It doesn't matter if you scribble or if you, like, color in. And then you take the app, and you basically, like, hold um, the picture that it has over the picture. And then it, um, it makes your dragon come to life with the colors that you use, and it's really cool. So we've just, you know, basically used the Colar app a little bit. Um, I, there's a, a great blog to follow um, called Three, Go Three Guys and Some iPad. No, Two Guys and Some iPads. I'm trying to duplicate them. Um, and it's Drew Minock and, and uh, Brad Wade. I'll drop their link in. And um, they've got a new show that's actually on the uh, EdReach network. And so they've got some fantastic resources on AR. And that's something I met them at the Podstock conference. and. So we've done a little bit, my wife's done a little bit with her class with AR, and that's something that I, I think is a little bit more on the gee whiz, wow, look at it side of things rather than the create it, make it side. I However, there's a connection here where, like I mentioned with Minecraft, at some point, just, just like the Augment app can allow you to view a Google, warehouse, a Google 3D warehouse object, um, you know, there's a, there, there's a potential for somebody to do that with Minecraft and objects that you do in Minecraft. Um, we have looked at the NASA 3D app where they've got spacecraft and stuff, but we need to learn more about that. Any, Rachel hasn't been able to hear anybody because um, we've just been talking. Does anybody want to grab the mic and ask a question? She's got one of the headset earbuds on. I can hear everything. <laughs> There's not much to hear yet. <laughs> Peggy's asking if anybody wants to take the mic. I'm reading you guys' comments. Teacher Cast had a question. All right. People are feeling shy today. So Rachel, what are you what are you planning? Lori asks, what are you planning for this year? 
Um, Tell them about your book. You've got some book ideas, right? I know, that's what I should say. Okay. <laughs> um, well, one thing that I've always liked to do is I like to read books. And in the third grade, I finished um, the first four Harry Potter books. And um, I'm working on the other ones. And so I really like to read. And another thing I really like to do is write. I like to write my own stories. Um, for fun, and my friend and I, um, we made a picture book together, and I would um, write the pages, and she would draw pictures, and then we published our book called Snowflake Gets Lost on Lulu.com, and it was really great, and I think she enjoyed it, and so now I'm making my own short little chapter books, and I'm working on some right now, so I'm wanting to take my writing skills farther. That's right. In fact, next week, on Saturday, in a week from now, there's a conference in Oklahoma City that's a writer's conference, and Rachel's going to go, and we're going to, um, yeah, that's right, meet your own show. <laughs> we're, and it's gonna, there, there's uh, three authors in Oklahoma City that together have published over 100 books, like 104, 107 books, and so anyway, it's going to be neat for her to get to meet some real authors. I mean, we're real authors too, I guess, yeah. <laughs> to meet some other people who are authors, and um, I want to make some of my books into movies like J.K. Rowling did with Harry Potter. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, and actually one of the authors at this Oklahoma City Writers Conference just had one of her, non, her fiction books turned into a screenplay yeah. that they just made into a movie. So I want to do that. There's all kinds of connections with writing, and um, I hope that we're going to be able to use some, some other apps to make the books what are called highlighted text, where when, when you read it, then it highlights the words. And uh, we, there was one app we learned about um, <laughs> when, we, when I was in Chicago about that, but I'm going to look for more apps like that, and that might be a way to release some books, as books that have highlighted text in them. Okay, come on. Somebody here can ask a, a question over audio. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, uh, Aunt Amy has a question. We're... We're looking at doing iPad media camps in some different places. One of them is in Houston. Um, so get in touch with me if you're uh -huh. interested in that. And there have been a couple times where Rachel's been able to teach. And she got to teach this July when we were in Kansas. Dad, I want to go to was, India. Well, that's Indiana, sweetie. Oh. <laughs> but Indiana <laughs> would be fun, too. <laughs> Indiana or India, I don't mind. They both sound cool. That's right. All right. Anybody take the mic? <laughs> okay, so here's a question from Lisa. If I do a media camp for kids, what are the top three things that you would do? So what would you teach if you were doing, if you, so you're making advice for somebody doing a media camp? Um, for a media camp for kids, you probably um, should introduce Book Creator so kids can make ebooks. And also introduce Puppet Pals because Puppet Pals allows you to make puppet videos, and that's really fun. Um, you want to say anything about Scratch? Here, you take your okay. You haven't done Scratch in a few months, but what would you say about Scratch? Well, Scratch is um, a thing where you get to make your own games and videos, and it's all based on math, which is it's a fun way to do math. And it's complicated, and you really have to use your brain. So I think it's also good for students' use. It's not iPad-based, but it's... it's Computer. Good, yeah. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> Teacher Cass says, use your brain. No. <laughs> All right. I think we've got a football parade to go to. Thanks for hanging around for a little bit longer. Peggy's asking, what do you like to do with puppets? Um, I just like to um, get my characters and just make up little stories and make them move and talk and stuff. Dialogue. Yeah. All right. Well, definitely check those apps out if you haven't already. Yeah. All right. Well, everyone have a great day. Thanks for hanging out longer, and thanks so much for the Classroom 2 live team for doing your great work. Thank you, Wes and Rachel. Mm -hmm. Very nice meeting you. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Nice to meet you.